we it started as a commission uh, from Veld in Stockholm, and the commission took place at the National Museum in Stockholm, and uh, it started with a curiosity with the habits that we have when we look at art. And um, for example, there is very often uh, a way of looking at art that could be sometimes a bit rushed. We go from one picture to the next picture. So you want to, in a way, create a work where we experiment with the way we look at art. We learn a lot about the museum doing this research, basically. We come about one, one month before the, the work opens and we're trying to understand that museum's particular history, but also the, the, the existing curatorial space, when we're going to show the piece, what exhibition is on, and so on. And we have realized, for example, when we did the piece in Acropolis Museum uh, last year, to, uh, to, to 2012 it was, uh, from researching around up in Acropolis, uh, uh, we sort of saw tourists taking images of themselves and with the artworks and so on. So the question, like, how can you access historical work and how can, you, how can it make any sense for you today more than just being a, an object that you are sort of, uh, that is quite curious for you or something like that? And also we always have, we always look at history through the particular goggles of our time. So in a way to deconstruct those goggles or glasses that we use to look, when we look at art history, because these... This describes something about the time where we are, and we want to kind of yeah. create a more transparent way of accessing those artworks yeah. from history. Yeah, so although Symphony of Missing Room is uh, uh, an autonomous work, or it's, it's, a, it's a work existing on its own, it also is a, somewhat a curatorial tool for accessing collections of museums and also historical work. Um, um, I think, as an artwork, Symphony of the Missing Room is our uh, attempt to, to make a, a, an immaterial artwork that is taking place in the consciousness of the visitors or the perceiver of, of the artwork. So the perceiver or the visitor is both the, um, uh, 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 the perceiver of the work but also the medium uh, or the, uh, that, or that produces the content otherwise. So this, the work doesn't really exist on its own. It really requires someone to step into it. This also means that the visitor has uh, the ownership of, because whatever images that you see, because they're parts of the work that are also uh, when you're being blindfolded. So the images that you as a visitor create, uh, you own those images, not we as artists. Well, they can expect an extremely personal journey and experience that I think will differ. They come in in a, in a small group and um, they are met with a guide and I suppose it starts almost like a traditional museum or gallery tour in a yes. way. Um, but then at one point they are given headphones and um, then we'll start a sound, a sort of a soundscape mm. that will come into the ear which might be recordings from the place that we're in. It will be from the Royal Academy and the galleries there. Um, yeah, exactly. It's, it's important that that, that um, uh, the visitors feel that they have arrived to the museum and they they, they somewhat are walking walking into the the instructions of the the museum sort of silently gives you that how how you are walking and watching or viewing art in a museum. But then you somewhat departs uh, into this parallel. Uh, viewing in a sense because you're giving instructions and suggestions from this voice that walks with you but eventually mm. I mean I, we're not going to tell too much of this mm. but eventually of course you are getting uh, goggles that uh, deprive you from your vision and from that point onwards you are somewhat departing into deep uh, or, or, or art history at, at least um, but not only art history but also our own history from mm. because Symphony of a Missing Room has now visited about 10 different museums so in a way you enter the recording of all those different museums architecturally we have collected the sound so in a way it's an archive of museums That's that you I'm enter not. as well If, if you, as a, a viewer of this uh, at home now, of, if you are using your headphones now at this point, you should hear me speaking. And if you are coming like this, you should hear me coming closer to you. 
and now speaking in the other ear here. And this is um, our main tool for creating all of our work in a sense because as you see the microphone and I should actually turn it like this because then it should mimic the way you should hear us now if you're facing us frontally like this. Um, when you don't see anything uh, of course all of the other senses gets more activated and with this microphone we have the advantage of creating a sound that is as perfect as it can be from natural sound. So we can recreate a recorded sound as it, and when you play it out, it feels like it's really there next to you. Um, and we work with this microphone for the voice that goes with you, that it really feels like there is someone there. But also we um, record, for example, as Martina said, that we have recorded about, you know, we have, the piece have been in 10 different museums. So when we pass through those spaces, when we have recorded from those 10 different museums, some traces of that is also here in Royal Academy. So you can sort of uh, go into the, uh, uh, for example, uh, to leave the summer exhibition, open a door and go into the museum in, in, in Hamburg, for example, and then you walk into another door and then you pass through the National Museum in Stockholm. Um, and the traces of the people and, and what we felt was important at those sites is also part of well, this, this work one. is also slightly different than all the other symphonies in a way that we're dealing with a summer exhibition. But we're not only dealing with and looking at the selected works, but we are actually putting some light onto the rejected works, which is almost in a way like the negative space of the exhibition. And we're asking questions of history and how they leave traces and um, how uh, the function and tension in between the forgotten and the remembered. Getting to know the building of the Royal Academy, mm. which is incredible, going from a gallery space back to the fine rooms, which have so much history in them. And that's really important because um, we're look, obviously looking at the space the work's going to happen and how that is going to inform the piece and so the, the architecture of the building itself. And that's been really exciting mm. going behind all the doors that you can't normally go behind. Mm. Um, so we've been doing that and um, we will be making recordings with the head here um, people in the gallery and tours that are happening inside the gallery. We're also looking through the sound archive here uh, where we listen to historical speeches that took place at the annual dinners at the Royal Academy and we might use those as well. If we already found that in one site where, where the, this tour will take place and a very important part of the tour because here you are getting uh, the, the white uh, goggles on that makes you only see light and shadow. And, and, and this place where the sort of virtual uh, or parallel tour starts, we saw that in this very room, uh, uh, Charles Darwin gave his paper of uh, 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 the origin of species, so, which is just fantastic. It's just incredible that this is the very room where that took place. I mean, it's such an important historical event. So I think, um, Symphony of a Missing Room at Royal Academy is also spanning not only, I mean, uh, the, the history of art, but also, you know, the larger history, the history of science and perception as well. That, that is so important for this work. <laughs> 